Hello. Thank you for coming. I'm Graham from Rock Paper Shotgun. The panel we've got for you now is Dick Hogg and Ricky Haggett, the developers of Wilmot's Warehouse. And Alice Bell is going to ask them lots of fascinating questions. I'll hand it over to them Hi. now. No pressure. Hello. Yeah, there you go. You've got to hold them quite, quite, close, quite close to your mouth. Hello. There you go. Hello. Yeah. It's <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and Wilmot's Warehouse, which we're here to talk about today, amazing. Uh, RPS uh, chose it as our uh, Can't Stop Playing for uh, one of our, was it a couple of months ago last month? Um, uh, and so I'm delighted to talk to you today. But um, why don't we start and talk a little bit about your kind of partnership? Because you've been making games together for 12 all, years. 12 years, by me. How, how, how does that work? How do you sort of divide the... We had a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a couple of years off. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, you were asking, how does that... How, how do, you know, uh, maybe uh, tell our audience about some of the games that you've made before, just give them a little bit of a, a grounding, a little bit of context on, on the Richards, Hogg and Haggart. Yeah, okay, so we made, uh, we started making games together with a game called Hohokum, um, which took quite a long time to make. But we made a few other smaller games yeah, on, along the way, that. we made a game called Frobisher Says, which is like a strange party game for the Vita. And we made a one-button game called Poto and Kabenga, which was like a little creature running along and gets swallowed by a dragon and then is inside the dragon's stomach. And you have to simultaneously control his little beast and him with one button. Blimey. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah we, um, we started making games as a hobby, really. Like, we both had full-time jobs, and we were making games in our spare time. I mean, my, my full-time job was making games. Uh, <laughs> yeah, mine wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we can maybe use that as a jumping-off point, because I, I believe that you ha worked in a warehouse, and this yes. sort of was the seed yes. that became Walmart's warehouse. I worked, uh, when I was a student, uh, I worked in the Asda warehouse for a long time, and then I worked in a Boots warehouse, and then I also, when I left um, college, my first proper job, I spent a year working in, a, in like, a, like a film library, like a, fo like a photo, yeah, photography yeah. archive, yeah, which, which isn't a warehouse, but is a kind of a similar, similar yeah. thing. Am I holding this too close to my mouth? No, no you're fine. Oh, no, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's that, that's a yeah, similar, similar kind of job. Mm. And I loved all three of those jobs. Yeah. What, what is it about that kind of monotonous uh, stacking, I guess. I think it's because I'm quite a simple person, and I, and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I just found them really rewarding jobs. I think they're quite, I think, I think you can make a job like that where you're just in charge of where a load of stuff goes. I think you can make it quite interesting for yourself in, and uh, in quite obvious, sort of almost gamey ways mm. by just, um, I don't know, like timing yourself, how quickly, like every night when I got to Asda, I'd be like, I wonder if I can beat my record for how quickly to, I can get all, the, all of the dog food <laughs> picked. I don't know why, but for some reason, dog food was like my big benchmark. <laughs> Probably because it's like the biggest, heaviest thing, I guess. Yeah. And it was in a really awkward place in the warehouse as well, on a corner. Yeah. And um, yeah, things like that. And also just trying to optimize your route around. So you've got a list of things you have to, like everyone's done that when you go to the supermarket, you know, you, mm. you don't have to work there to have this experience. If you're just doing your shopping in the supermarket, you know, if you're making your list, everyone puts their fruit and veg at the, at the top, don't they? So that, that cause that's yeah. the bit you're gonna hit first. Yeah, yeah. And then you can get more and more into that. The, the more familiar you become with that place, yeah. the, more, the more you can drill down into optimizing your your route, your route around it constantly based on this ever growing sort of intimacy with, with, with the space. Mm. And then of course you can also, as you work, the longer you spend there, you have opportunities to change it as well and say, well, actually we're now, now that we're stocking um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle items, <laughs> maybe they should all go here. <laughs> Wait, For That's an example from my real life. <laughs> <laughs> C Catherine, our hardware editor is in the front row. Maybe you should use dog food as benchmarking for your graphics cards now. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Ricky, I understand that you didn't necessarily uh, get on board with the idea for Wilmot's Warehouse. Yeah, Dick, Dick <laughs> pitched us this idea. After we made Hohokum, he pitched this idea. Hey, we, maybe we could make this warehouse game. 
and we just kind of took the piss out of him for <laughs> about about a year until he stopped talking about it. Um, uh, yeah, like I, I guess I was sort of imagining it being like this realistic, like like. 3D first person warehouse yeah, that's maybe. what I wanted it to be as well yeah <laughs> yeah that was the original yeah. pitch and I was just like I wasn't really feeling it for spending loads of time and energy making a warehouse simulator really um, so yeah we just yeah we just Rick, it was Rick, just a joke it was Ricky, in- Ricky and this other guy called Nathan who, who w- was working for our publisher at the time they started deciding that it would be uh, as a way of kind of bullying me <laughs> They decided it should be called Clown Warehouse, and that all of the things uh, in the warehouse should be clown supplies. And, and every time I try and have a serious conversation about it, I'd say, "Oh, and then the delivery lorry. This is where the delivery lorry would come in." And then Nathan would go on, "Do the doors fall off?" <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it was actually really humiliating and and, uh, and, ho- and horrible, horrible experience. Do you feel bad about yeah. it now? No, okay. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> It's actually a remnant of that because then when we, more recently when we made a, we, we made a two-player co-op mode for the game, we decided to make the second player look more like a clown. <laughs> and it's actually, this is him here, look. You can oh, see yeah. him here. <laughs> yeah, he's got the clown, the clown mouth, yeah. Uh, so how then did you, you get from the sort of the idea of 3D sort of to what Wilmot's Warehouse is now, which we can see on the screen behind us, this kind of strange collection of images and sort of slightly abstracted So yeah, like, like, like we said at the start, we had a little break from working together. Um, I was making a game called Loot Rascals and Dick was doing like mostly, I guess, illustration work, right? Like your, your Yeah, I was doing illustration. I, w- I kind of went back to making illustrations for like advertising and things like that for a bit. And, um, but he was still like tinkering around with like the idea of making a game and he didn't really know what he wanted to make, but he, I think you were, you were talking about making a match three game for ages. And yeah, you, and I still you want to make a match three game. Yeah, you made loads of tiles for a match three game. Well, for any game, I don't know. Like I, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I, because I, I can't do any programming or anything, and, and I, I really don't have any skills <laughs> a, a, other than drawing. And um, so I was thinking about ideas for games, but I had no way of, of like making those real. So I started just drawing all the all of the tiles. Four but ended up being all of the products in this game, but trying for thinking in terms of like maybe these could be the tiles in a match free game or maybe some other kind of um, kind of some sort of a grid, pa- a grid based puzzle game of some, some sort kind, of grid based yeah. puzzle game yeah and um, and all the time Ricky was this time Ricky was busy with um, loot rascals and I had this idea of like I was going to send them out to uh, to like a bunch of like other game devs and see if anyone wanted to use them to make a game but I never had the courage to do it and I never sent them I only sent them to Ricky <laughs> yeah you made Dick made a really lovely PDF that was like a kind of uh, it was like a kind of request for collaboration document. yeah like an invitation to collaborate yeah. yeah it was really sweet and I, and I gave him a little list of people because I was like I'm not making a fucking no, match no I already game. had my list <laughs> no well, I, I was gonna I know I knew all the kind of cool indie devs I was gonna send it to you yeah. know yeah and then you just chickened out and I just couldn't yeah I didn't do it <laughs> Um, so yeah, then then um, around that time, I I went uh, back to Ireland. My my in-laws live in Ireland, uh, in like, quite a rural place, and it it's Christmas. Usually, yeah, Christmas time. And m- usually I just take my laptop, and it's like I might just do some tinkering like, while the kids are just like outside running around or whatever. Do some like little tinkering around with a thing that I wouldn't do in any other time. You know, it's not anything to do with my normal what work. What Ricky's trying to say is that even when he goes on holiday, his, Ricky's idea of a, of a holiday is working on a different video game. <laughs> well, this, this, definitely this specific holiday slot, yes. <laughs> going, going to Ireland for Christmas, yes. Fair. Um, and yeah, I just had this idea. I don't know, remember why, but I was just like, I, maybe this warehouse game that Dick's going on about would work with these colourful tiles. <laughs> Did you get visited uh, by three ghosts? <laughs> 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 Ghost of Warehouse Past, yeah, um, yeah, and I and it was just like a really easy thing to make. Like I, I, it was a thing I can imagine spending three days making a little thing, and so I just cut up his PDF and made a little thing and then sent it to him for Christmas. Yeah, it was very touching. I was very moved. <laughs> so was the that PDF? Did you have sort of most of the? Is it five hundred and one? Yeah, five hundred five hundred and one yeah. products. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the, like the tra- famous trousers. 
<laughs> I only thought of that. It's a good joke. <laughs> um, no, I think at that point there was only 200, maybe, mm. things, yeah. But yeah. We made more. The, ori the original version was just like, it was basically, it was a hatch that pushed them all in from the left, and you, we were just a cursor. There was no Wilmot. You mm. were just like, uh, like a little square, you know, a square with just the corners of the square, and you could just move anywhere. Yeah. And you, there was no real, like, gameplay. There was no timers or, like, people asking you for stuff. Mm. It was just this stuff kept coming into the side, and you could just pick it up arbitrarily with the mouse and just move it anywhere and drop it. Mm. Yeah. Um, to backtrack a bit to when I was just making all, all the art without you, before you did that, there was an interesting thing going on where I was almost like, although I can't make a video game, I was making like, I was making like game design decisions in the context of drawing all these things because I was kind of um, deliberately trying to make overlapping categories, you know, deliberately trying to make things where you would go, oh, this thing could be in the fruit category or it could be in the general food category or it could be in the things that have been sliced in half category or it can be in the, in the category that's to do with what color it is. And so, as I was drawing all the stuff, it's a, I just think this is a really good example of how you can, actually do, you can actually do meaningful game design tasks outside of the context of even using a computer or mm. knowing anything about how to make a game. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of game design just in the tiles of Wilmot's Warehouse, right? Like, I think the art in that game has got so, like, apart from being beautiful, it's incredibly functional in the way that there's loads of interesting overlaps and especially like, especially the objects that you're not exactly sure what they are, where like you could get, show it to like three people and they all tell you it's a different thing. Um, that's like a really important part of Wilmot's Warehouse. Yeah. I don't think it would, it would work very well if it was, everything was just really obvious what it was. Did you watch that, did you watch that YouTube thing where that guy's talking about how awful the art is? <laughs> it's really good, it's really, loads of views. <laughs> Some kind of, I don't know who it is, some sort of, sh I don't want to say the name of it because, yeah, but some, somebody that reviews games and gets lots of views on YouTube that did a little short, like, little short about Wilmot's Warehouse. Mostly, they enjoyed it, didn't they? Yeah, mostly they enjoyed it, but then at the end he was like, oh, but the art's really, like, perfunctory. You know, <laughs> I, I think the guy, I think whoever made this game just, like, bought two asset packs. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the point. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's fine. Well, then. I'm really glad that you said that there's a things that have been sliced in half category because I feel very yeah, yeah, vindicated by that. Yeah, there is a things that have been sliced in half. Because there's what there's. I think I have a big argument uh, between myself and uh, Nate about a, a tile that I am convinced is half an egg. Yeah, <laughs> and it is. And That's canon. It's half an egg. Yes. Assuming you mean the same tile that I'm thinking of. I'm yeah. pretty sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it went, uh, it originally was part of the Humble um, original. Uh, humble bundle. Trove. Yes, sorry. Trove. It, really, yeah, humble has humble. many things. Um, and so what was the process of sort of getting from there to full release? Was uh, you change a, a lot going I think that. yeah we, re we released it and then and then we entered it into the IGF and we got nominated for design mm. and the IGF at, at GDC and I think out of that came a general desire to keep going mm. like loads of people played the humble version and got back to us and like really enjoyed it and, and gave us like nice feedback and and then we and, and out of IGF we got a bunch of like sort of you know people who played it for IGF as jurying, mm. giving us loads of amazing feedback and like I ideas, and those things together kind of made us feel like the version we released wasn't like the definitive one and yeah. we could keep going. Felt like we'd not got it quite right, uh, and that the game deserved a bit more. Yeah, deserved to be kind of revisited and 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 yeah, made into something. Yeah, almost we could. Yeah, we, we had a sniff of how it could be better, so we, we thought we better. And it hasn't it that. hasn't changed in any apart from apart from like um, two player co op. If you looked at videos of the original version and the current version, you probably wouldn't you'd find it hard to tell any difference. But there's so many things that got either completely redesigned or just subtly changed in ways that involve Dick playing it for hundreds of hours mm. and just tweaking things really carefully. Mm. Um, yeah, you you played that game. Like so much, <laughs> like yeah. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I did a lot of playtesting, and like um, Dick, Dick would say, like I'd speak to him on a Monday, and he'd been playing it all weekend, and and he'd be like, yeah, this is definitely like I, I don't think I can do any more playthroughs now. Like that's the last playthrough <laughs> I ever have to do, 
and, 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 and that was probably only halfway through the process he was <laughs> saying things like that. Yeah, I think I was saying to, when we did that interview with Nate, I think I was saying that um, I got to points where I kind of felt like I was going mad. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and it's really hard playing your own game, you know? If, if anyone's tried it, it's really hard. Or, you know, because it's hard to kind of put yourself in the position of genuinely someone who's, who's not the person that made it. Mm. Um, but then if you push, if, it depends on the kind of game you're making. Like some games, games that involve some kind of knowledge, like knowing the solution to, to a kind of puzzle or knowing that a surprise is about to happen. Those games are really hard to play test if you're mm. the person that made it. But if you're making something like a roguelike or, or like an, a game with more emergent um, mechanics in it, then, then you can effectively play it as if you're not the person that made it. Um, but you still kind of are very aware that it's your game. Mm. And then after a while, you go through that period of kind of feeling like you're going a bit mad. Then after a while, you kind of hit this brick wall of like hating it so much <laughs> and that you, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, yeah. I guess. That you just really don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> and you almost are reborn. You, you suddenly find yourself reborn as this person that really doesn't care, any, really, really doesn't care about his game anymore. And <laughs> you might as well have not been the person that made it. And you might actually find yourself thinking like, Who's this fucking idiot who made it? Yeah, you might actually find yourself think, thinking about the person that made the game in a negative way and then going, oh, actually, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think I went through that cycle a few times, yeah. Um, but a really important point is that I'm not, I'm not advocating spending lots and lots of time playtesting your own game in a kind of really sort of macho, you've got to do the work kind of, <laughs> kind of you've got to put the hours in kind of way because that's nonsense. I, it's more, I think more just that you should make it, it, it should be a, a big part of your development time, but, but not in a kind of, kind of self-abuse way, mm. like in a sensible grown-up way where, where you, you schedule for it and you, and you uh, have lots of breaks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Was, look after yourself, it was the main, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like you, drew, you finished all the art relatively early on, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then that process where we were like, you know, we'd released the humble version, and, and it was like almost two years before we released. Vermin. Most of what what you were doing there was just playtesting, yeah, 19... and being the client, kind of being the yeah, no... being the like person that wanted this game to exist. Yeah, ninety percent of my labour on this game was playtesting. I, I, yeah. I'd, I'd say probably, yeah. or just thinking, writing stuff about it, and thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favourite a favourite tile? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't know. On the uh, on the Finji Discord, my. Uh, my avatar, do people say avatar? Yeah. Yeah, my avatar is the bar of soap tile <laughs> because I like, I just, look, just like it. But then on our Slack, it's the camel, it's, one of the, it's the camel's head one. So maybe it's one of those two because well, they're the two that I just gravitated towards to represent myself. <laughs> but that's a really, I don't know. A clean camel. A clean camel, <laughs> yeah, soapy camel. Do you, do you have a favorite? Um, I really like the sunset ones. Oh, so I think they're really lovely. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what, what about you, Ricky? Do you have one or any that you I like? like in I particular? like my own Twitter icon. <laughs> I like just Poto from the game Poto oh, yeah, and Kabenga. Yeah, so Ricky's, yeah, Ricky's Twitter <laughs> icon is, is, a, is a product and a thing. Yeah. That's what, yeah. It's very self-centered of you. <laughs> <laughs> you drew it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I did want to ask briefly as well about the, um, I suppose, not political aspects of it, but it, do, it does sort of gently sort of satire almost the, that kind of uh, with the motivational posters that you get and yeah. and the fact that your rewards are all just things that let you do your job better uh, yeah do you want to talk about this i, I can do she was yeah. asking you alice was asking you but I mean, it's <laughs> open to both of you I, don't <laughs> I feel like i feel like that that stuff we talked about that loads didn't we like the yeah. vibe getting the vibe of that stuff right yeah like um, um somebody asked me Somebody recently on Twitter was like calling me out saying, does Wilmot's Warehouse deal with unionization? <laughs> and, and also lots of people talking about it as an Amazon simulator as yeah. well. Yeah. Like, and uh, I, I felt bad that it doesn't, it doesn't actually handle the subject of unionization. I actually do feel genuinely bad about that. And I kind of wish it, wish, it, wish it did. It does, so lots, yeah, as Ricky just said, lots of people when they see Wilmot's Warehouse, the, a way of describing it or a way of, kind of, a way of kind of trying to encapsulate it in a sentence is they say Amazon Simulator, mm. Amazon Warehouse Simulator. And actually, 
Uh, it's not at all because it, it's it's a simulation of a, of a warehouse that existed before the way warehouses were before the sort of frightening practices that that, com that companies like Amazon have have introduced into logistics. And actually, uh, lots of people there are still lots of people that work in logistics who who work in warehouses that are still like the warehouses that I had the mm. privilege of working in in the, in the 1990s. You know, where you do have, yeah, like the sort of things I was talking about earlier about optimizing your own route around the warehouse and, and almost like making it quite a playful experience or at least one that, at least one way you can kind of every day in a really sort of fundamental way just just try and be more, try and, try and be better at the job in a way that's rewarding. Yeah, people having agency in their own working lives. Exactly, yeah, isn't yeah. It, is like an important part of yeah. working and, yeah. and the fact that that like companies like Amazon are kind of removing that agency where they're turning people into literally just like effectively robots that just get a list of instructions about where to go and pick pick the things from where they're told to go feels really like dark. I think this is common knowledge now, but just in case anyone didn't realize it, the way that an Amazon warehouse works is that all the stuff is, is random. Everything in the warehouse is just put anywhere. So the people taking, st the people bringing stock into the warehouse can just put it anywhere they like as long as the computer knows where it is. So even two things that are the same product don't have to be next to each other at all, which is really strange. <laughs> and then, so then the pickers go around and they're just told, go to this location and pick up what's there, go to this location and pick up what's there. And it, there is no rhyme or, like, unless you happen to be the computer that chooses those picking routes, the whole thing seems completely uh, arbitrary. There's no rhyme or reason to it, which is such a terrible, just imagine trying to work in that environment. Mm. It, it literally makes it impossible for you to give a shit about <laughs> about any of, any of the stuff. It's yeah. really, yeah. But I mean, Wil Wilmot seems quite happy. He's got a cheery yeah, like, yeah. So, so, like I was saying, like a lot of people still work in warehouses that are not like that. So, so um, when I was sending builds out for people to play test, all of the people that work in like a record distribution warehouse in East London played it. And uh, really? gave me some good feedback, yeah. And uh, they're people that are lucky enough to work in distribution jobs where it's still like a nice human, you know, it's on a human scale where you can, yeah, it's like a, a real space that people feel ownership over and familiarity with and, and they have nice tea breaks and things. And yeah, I think, my, I'd li yeah, you know, lots of warehouses are still like that, definitely. Um, the, game, the game gently... The, the, the game gently introduces the theme of automization and 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 kind of uh, I don't know if satirizes is the right word, but it, it it hopefully makes you think about how automization is changing the nature of people's jobs, mm. but in a very gentle, light-hearted, hum sort of humorous way, which is the only way me and Ricky can really talk about anything. So, yeah, uh, I did want. To ask, because going back a little bit, you mentioned that um, originally there was no Wilmot. It was just so. At what stage did you decide you needed a a face? We got quite far. We we got to the point where you could play the whole game and and stuff would get delivered. Customers would be there. There'd be like um, upgrades, I think. Um, and it just kind of sucked that you were this. Um, you, you just were this floaty thing that could go through everything, and it and and it meant that you know keeping a warehouse tidy wasn't a, a big deal a lot of the time when you're like moving around because you could just go through everything, and yeah, and and then it was like well maybe we should give the player a physical presence, and then as soon as you give the player a physical presence, of course it has to have a little smiley face on it, <laughs> and then and then out of that you start to spin like a much more of a sort of sense of the world and the other characters and mm. just the general vibe and the tone of it. But yeah, like it was, it was pretty fully playable just without a character. Um, and, and, and introducing a character added loads of hard problems because as, as, as soon as Wilmot exists and has a physical presence and can get trapped, you then have to deal with like, oh, what happens when you just can't get through this gap with all the stuff you're carrying? Do you then have to like drop it all somehow move it all around so you can get through the gap and then pick it all up again. That really sucks. So it's like, oh no, you should be able to push blocks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but all of that introduced a whole, that introduced a whole level of, a whole like class of kind of puzzle gaming, which, which is actually like became quite a big part of yeah. what the game is. So, yeah. so that's a good yeah. thing.
think. And do you have a, a sort of favorite way to, because it was funny, when we were sort of in our real like madness of playing it, we'd all at lunchtime, we'd like load up our warehouses and sort of give each other tours. Of like how, and you know really how good. like I don't when, believe you, but it's good. I when like someone's it. parking a van, and suddenly like three other people who've parked a van before will turn up and go, "Oh yeah,", yeah. <laughs> like we'd all kind of gather around like Graham's screen and be like, "Oh, that's why you put that." Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's what, interesting, like, Graham. <laughs> yes. And then go, Grant's an idiot, and then go back and and do your warehouse property. So do you have? Uh, favorite ways to categorize your warehouse. Rick, Ricky's never played it. I don't play Walmart's warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've played that game thousands of times, but only to like test how how Wilmot moves around, picks things up, <laughs> rotates things. I've yeah. never actually played the game for more than about twenty minutes. This I, is a huge coup. I wasn't yeah. expecting. I don't it. like Tetris either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I. I'm the worst person to talk about this because I know what all the stuff is. And I, I was going to say, are you like the canon? The canon yeah, is all in so your head. It's like. really hard for me to not just organize it the way that I kind of know it should be. Yeah. But maybe I'm wrong. Like, I'm just the guy that um, drew it. But because <laughs> but the game does have built in categories. Yeah. It has categories that aren't built in as well, but it, has, it does have sort of built in obvious categories. Mm. Or maybe they're not that obvious. So it's hard for me to not organize by those because I know what they are. But sometimes I, I force myself and I, um, I'm bemused by people that just organize by color. Uh, really? Personally, yeah. yeah. And especially there's, a, there's people that don't just organize by color. I've seen people on, on the internet saying, yes, the best way to play Wilmot's Warehouse is to organize by the color of the top left pixel of every tile. So whatever the top left <laughs> pixel is, that's where they go. And it's like... That's how it chooses what color the bar graphs are. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, like, it totally makes sense to, to play it like that, but I, as long as you're still having fun, I guess. But, <laughs> but it seems well, it's, a bit... It, it's possible to play Walmart's Warehouse not organizing anything as well. Yeah, of course Just it let is, the yeah. stuff, just leave it where it is and just like remember where everything is. It's just like not fun at all. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we had a playtester who did that, a young yeah, guy who, yeah. uh, who playtested it like that. that. That man's an axe murderer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's people that have done like really overcomplicated systems where they've got like index objects. So they've got like oh, yeah. one example of a certain thing at the ends of the aisles to tell you what is then down that aisle. Ah. So almost using, using objects as signs for where the rest of them are. Because of the view distance. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's smart. And um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I've played it a lot where I've tried to organize different ways just to sort of get my head around it, mm. but I think my favorite is just what I think the things are. Can I ask a question about the drawing the tile art? When, you, when Dick was drawing the tile art, he had like a system for how he, was, uh, how he drew the tiles, and I can't remember what it is anymore. No, this isn't true. <laughs> uh, it's not, I, I, I just had a, t I just timed myself. Wow, really? Yeah, I just had a, a I just had a, um, I just set myself a time limit of how many minutes per tile, just so I could get through them. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, and I can't remember what it was, but, but, um, but I can tell you that the, that the outline versions take lots longer to draw than the, than the, than the full color versions. Mm. Um, but I, I was thinking about like a more complicated rule of like only so many, like only so many objects or so many shapes per tile or something like that. But in the end, it wasn't feasible because some things just need more detail, and, and that's mm. just yeah. Well, I think we're the nature of it. Yeah, we're probably we're we're on to question time now. Questions. I think so. Does it's, it's, have all, it's all just been questions already. Audience questions. <laughs> okay. Normal person <laughs> questions. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Maybe if you want a definitive answer on what one of the tiles is, now's the time. I've got a question. There's a couple. There. Have you not got one of those balls with a microphone in it? I think, yeah, I guess. Yeah, all right. You've got Graham, you make him run yeah, around. It's the same job, yeah. Dick, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. What, what's the hexagon behind your head? <laughs> this. Oh, that's interesting. So this whole category is needlework. And it's like a patchwork, like a patchwork quilt. Oh, yeah? I thought it was a sequin. Oh, it could be. But look, you've got... Um, Patchwork, 
This is a needle being threaded. Yeah. This is a sewing machine. Uh -huh. This is a pincushion. This is a thimble. This is a button. Yeah, you know, you get, yeah. <laughs> this is an embroidery egg. <laughs> it's what? <laughs> <laughs> this should have been the whole panel, just you describing yeah. what these yeah, things yeah. are. Uh, Ricky, um, Hello. you mentioned that when you added a character and added Wilmot, he introduced a lot of design difficulties. One of the designs I think is quite interesting is the way that Wilmot was able to pick up and drop multiple items with the cursor. How difficult was it to come up with that system and how did you get to that eventually? Yeah, for, for multiple control schemes, right? So the question was, um, like, yeah, when you, have, when you have a character, he has to be able to pick up and drop multiple items at once. And with a mouse and keyboard, that's not too bad. Like, obviously, you have to deal with, like, if you, if you slice off things that can no longer be held anymore, you have to just drop them. So, like, if there's, like, you know, if you, you chop, chop off the thing closest, everything downstream of that just gets lost. That's fairly straightforward. Um, but picking up was really hard because um, you kind of want a button. Like, oh, especially on controller, you just want a button that's going to pick it up. And, like, what should it do when you press the button? And we spent a long, long time... Uh, trying stuff before we came up with the idea of like a cursor that sits over the blocks that you have control over that that and and then and then figuring out like originally the original implementation of that was the cursor spawns on Wilmot always but actually it turns out you can do rather better than that in terms of deciding where to put it so it can you know if you if you have a bunch of blocks and they and, and the game knows what you're after and you move the cursor can go somewhere that probably makes sense um, and then it took even longer after that for us to realize that it would be a good idea to like have a just a left analog sti let stick do it and then just a modal button that just toggles between those two things. Um, and at each stage there were lots of arguments. It was the thing we, it was really the only thing we properly had like really in-depth back and forth complicated discussions I think about. Um, yeah. Yeah, it really was difficult. That was a really difficult process, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Adam, Adam Saltzman from Finji was really helpful with that. He, he, he had he had lots of good insights into into what would work there. I remember. Yeah. Um, so, anyone else? Oh. Yeah. Hi. Uh, for such an abstract game, it feels very British. Um, was that an intentional design decision, or was it just something that came out? It feels very British. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's because we were trying to get that grant where you can you get money. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm certainly joking. <laughs> um, I I think that that's a really so there are things in the game that tell you where it's set, and it has things like it has a tea break, and it, it has ha a, it has a poster with a giant map of the A5. Yeah, it has. Yeah, <laughs> um, Tamworth and and, and <laughs> Lutterford. It's actually set in Lutterworth. Lutterworth. <laughs> if anyone's interested, um, but. I don't think it was a really deliberate decision. I think it's just our, our nature to to set the game in a in the real world. I guess I don't know. Like I, I can't really remember why. Yeah, it just seemed to come naturally at some point in the game. Um, so we were talking about Reginald Perrin. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, which is a very very British sort of humor uh, sort of humor thing. And we were talking about that a lot as a sort of, as a kind of, as a, as a reference for how, for how we wanted the humor in the game to be. And then... We, uh, we pretty much lifted the boss in Reginald Perrin's yeah, CJ well, we straight it, yeah, from... Yeah, yeah, well, no, well, we, we did it very deliberately because it's, uh, uh, during development, the, the David Nobbs who wrote those books and screenplays died. And uh, I was very sad about that. So we decided to make the CJ character in the game literally be CJ as a very obvious, hopefully like a, a homage to, to, those, to those stories. And, um, and obviously that, make, that, that again is a very British thing. So it has, there, is a, there is a category of British things in the game as well. You may is have there? noticed, yes, there is. <laughs> and the one, that people, the one that loads of people on the internet don't know what it is, is the British Rail logo. Yeah, I love, <laughs> I love seeing people discuss what Americans, that is. Americans on Twitter going, what is this? And it's the British Rail logo. Like, how could you not know that? <laughs> well, or Cricket well, Stumps is another one that no one gets <laughs> as well. <laughs> Fantastic. I think we've maybe got time for, for, we've got time for one more. No? 
No problem. That's all right. Okay. Well, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Cheers, you Alice. Much. Round of applause, please.